Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn, I want to tell you something funny. This week, I received an email from Nikki Baldwin-Smith, who is in Tasmania. And they listen to our class every week. And he says, I'm dying to know who Carolyn is. Because every, every week, the recording begins with, thank you, Carolyn. So maybe some week, you'll, you'll teach the class. Um, Carolyn is a very special person who... Wow, 11 years ago agreed to be this class's director and has served us so faithfully and we couldn't have done it without you. So that's who Carolyn is, everybody. Uh, way back in the Stone Ages when I was in college, I was in Dr. Angus Springer's class uh, that was a drama class. And he gave us an assignment to do a, 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 a reading, a dramatic interpretation. And so whatever came over me, I have no idea. But I picked the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians to do as my dramatic reading. Now, I'll tell you why that's so strange, because I had to go to the library to get the Bible. You know, 1 Corinthians meant absolutely nothing to me. I knew of Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. And there's a huge difference. Uh, but even though I'd been raised in a, in a Christian home, I'd rejected it. And so it just was odd. It was just it wasn't like me, for one thing. Uh, say amen, Ellis. Amen. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't know why it, it popped up into my mind, but I, I did the reading and Dr. Springer made nice comments, and I got a very good grade on it. And I didn't think about it for another 10 years or so. Uh, when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, when I became a Christian, had a personal relationship with Christ. And as I began my Bible study, uh, I just happened upon 1 Corinthians 13. And I want to tell you guys, one of my frustrations that I have in putting this uh, lesson together today is that it means so much to me. So much. And sometimes I feel like the guy who's showing his vacation pictures. You know, nobody's as excited about it as you are, believe me. <laughs> believe me. Or, or grandchil grandchildren pictures, you know. No, you know. Nobody loves them like you do. And so I'm trying to share with you how special this chapter is to me. And I hope that in some small way it, it becomes special to you too. Uh, as I look, and, and, and I want to give you a background of the chapter to make sure that you put it in proper perspective because that makes a, a huge difference in how, you, uh, how it, it fits your life. The first is that in the, in the church at Corinth in, in the first century, uh, Paul, as you can tell from what we studied so far, has experienced a number of difficulties with that church. And one of the difficulties that apparently just set his hair on fire is the fact that there had arisen within the church a group that considered themselves super Christians. Uh, in other words, they had gifts that were superior to the others. They were somehow more devout. Uh, you know, you, you, we read about some of this, for example, in the Pharisees in, in Jesus' time who thought they were just kind of spiritually cut above. It, and we didn't escape this in first century Christianity either. And apparently there were those who actually looked down upon other Christians as being somehow, somehow not up to their standards. And so Paul spent a little bit of time so far addressing it. He's going to do it in a little, I believe, more powerful yet kinder way today. Let me set that aside. That, that's what's happening, and Paul's going to address that today. He's talked about spiritual gifts that we talked about last week. Set it aside, and I want you to, to think of something else. Remember when uh, Jesus is being confronted by some of his critics, and one said to him, you know, tell me what's the greatest commandment? Because, you know, they just knew whatever his answer was, they'd be able to tie him up, because you got ten, you know. And what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And then he says, and the second is like unto it. What's that? That wasn't one of the top ten, though. But Jesus kind of summed it all up, all the, all the commandments. And if you stop and think about it, if you do read the Ten Commandments, they all fall into those two categories. Love the Lord your God, love others as yourself. The word that's translated love there uh, from the Greek uh, is, is a word that we call agape uh, in different forms, agapao, agape. 
But that's the word, and I want you to kind of focus in on that because that's the word uh, that, that is used right there. Another one is in, uh, in John chapter 13, 34 through 35, when Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. You remember what it is? Love one another, that you love one another. And the root word there is agapao, the same word. So we're, talking, we're not talking about shades of meaning. And by the way, you've, you've heard uh, differences. You've undoubtedly heard in a sermon or Bible study lesson one time about the different words used for love. Phileo love, for example. Uh, and, and those shades of meaning, to tell you the truth, they were used almost interchangeably. There were some shades of, of, of meaning. But in this particular case, I want you to know there are no shades of meaning. He's using the very same word, agape, agapao. So when he talks about love, Jesus makes it clear that we are to love one another. And he tells us why. Why? So that they will know your mind. Who is they? The world. That's the identifying mark of a believer. If you don't believe it, look at what Jesus said. You love one another, and that's how they can tell your, your mind. So I want you to think about that as we read through the, the lesson today. And remember that, uh, that Jesus is talking about spiritual gifts here. There's been some argument about those who said, well, I have the gift of tongues. And if you don't have the gift of tongues, you're just not a believer. Or I have the gift of prophecy, and that's way better than the gift of tongues. So, you know, you can just kind of picture these people in your mind. Boy, I'm glad we're over that now, aren't you? Maybe so. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. When he talks about the tongues of men or of angels, you can just hear him addressing those who say, well, I speak in tongues. And he says, okay, congratulations. I'm proud of you. But you know what? If I speak in the tongues of men, in other words, just as we're doing here today, or of angels. Now, he's actually skipping those who say they have the gift of tongues. But he says, okay, let's don't talk about your gift of tongues. Let's talk about angels, the heavenly language. I can talk in, in my, own, my own speech, my own tongue, or even if I talked in the same language that the angels used to address the Lord or to praise the Lord, and I don't have love, then you know what? I'm just making noise. So all this speaking in tongues that they're so proud of, that, that they puff themselves up about, he says, you know, that's great. But if you don't have love, it's just noise. It's just racket. And I love his, his examples that he gives. He says, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Anybody ever just happened to be right in front of a cymbal when, when the guy clanged it? What, does that just wake you up or what? Noise, noise. And that's, that's the kind of, it's not a, it's not a pretty description Paul, Paul is painting here about those who are speaking in tongues without love. He said, you know what, it's just an irritation. It's just an angry noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Now I want you to stop and think what he said. Uh, there's also a Greek influence here in, in Corinth that's talking, and this is the root of, the beginning of Gnosticism, the idea that I have a special knowledge, that I have, I've been given a special revelation. And this said it actually infected the church at this time, too, that those who felt that they were superior says, well, you know what? I've got a special knowledge. God's revealed something special to me. So he says, okay, congratulations. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, not just the things that they claim that God's give them, given them revelation about it. He says, look, if God revealed all his mysteries to you, and if you have a faith that could literally move a mountain, but I don't have love, what am I? Now, let me tell you, the, the, the translation there is not a difficult one to make. He says, you know what? You're worthless. It means nothing. You know, that's great. I'm glad that you think that you have mysteries revealed to you, that you have superior knowledge, and that you even have a faith that can accomplish miracles. But you know what? If there's no love there, then it's not really anything. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. So he addresses those that say, well, okay, I not only give alms, I give above and beyond, beyond alms. I tithe. Uh, I give generously to the poor. Oh, if you don't have love, what's it worth? I'm glad you give to the poor. You know, don't stop doing that. But the fact of the business is, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. 
That's one example that he gives. What's the next? I surrender my body to the flames. That's a little difficult on the translation to know what he's talking about. But most, most scholars generally agree that he's referring to the martyrs. You know what? Even if I die for my faith and I don't have love, I gain nothing. Now, that's kind of hard to swallow. I want you to, to kind of wrap your head around that, if you will. If I die for the faith but have love... Uh, is he saying that the person who died wasn't a believer? He said, no, you could have been killed and, and, and be a true believer. But you know what? If there's no fruit, what have you gained? And then he goes into descriptions of love. Now, I want you to know that one of my frustrations these days is that we don't have an idea about what love is. I really don't think we do. I think the word's bandied about so much that, uh, you know, I hear one young person say, well, you know, I love my boyfriend or I love my girlfriend or something like that. And I think, well, you know, you've only known them for four days yeah. <laughs> or even only known them for 10 years. I mean, hey, uh, I don't think we really understand what love is. And so he's going to talk about love. He's, he's used the word love. He's used the word agape. But he's going to explain it now. And it's kind of interesting because in verses 4 through 7, he's going to give 15 descriptors of love. And it's interesting the way he does it because he's going to say what it is and what it isn't. And he's going to use seven descriptors, excuse me, seven for the camera, seven descriptors about what love is, but eight about what love isn't. So let's look. Love is patient and love is kind. I want you to stop and think about patient. Uh, we talk a lot in scriptures. Paul talks a lot. Jesus talked quite a bit about fruit. Okay? Uh, if something really has taken root in your life, uh, if you really believe in something, uh, then there will be changes in your behavior. There will be evidences in your behavior. There will be fruit. You know? You can, you can say you're an eagle, but if you're waddling and quacking, you know what? It's likely you're a duck. You know, no matter how much you protest that you're an eagle. Let's look at the fruit. So he said, okay, here's love. What is some of the fruit? It's patience. You will see patience evidenced. Am I the only one in here that struggles with that one? Okay. Love is kind. Now, I want you to stop and think about what he means about being kind. Uh, you can't be kind without love, I think. And you can't love without being kind. The two just kind of go hand in hand. It does not envy, and it does not boast. The word that's translated boast here is kind of a difficult one because it, it in essence, says brag without foundation. In other words, instead of saying boast, maybe we should have translated does not boast without reason. Now, you know, we like modesty, we like humility, but the fact is, Paul mentions in several places that he boasts. If I boast, let it be in Christ. But, he's, but this boast is talking about boasting and foundation. Boasting when you have no reason to be proud. That's not a sign of, of, uh, of love. It is not rude. Do you know I'm really beginning to wonder if in, in, in 21st century American society, we've, we've just completely lost that word? What is rude? Because we don't want to be, we don't want to call something rude because that would be judgmental. If, if something's not good behavior, you know, by, by whatever societal standards are, or like propriety and worship that we talked about two weeks ago, but you know what? If you, if you love, then you're not going to be rude. Offending sensibilities. It is not self-seeking. Uh, do you remember the, the word phylacteries? Have you come across the word phylacteries? It's kind of interesting because uh, in, in Jesus' time, uh, the very religious people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, typically the scribes, uh, when, they, when they dressed for the day, they would have the little box on their forehead, and it's just supposed to contain a little scripture. Well, if having a box on your forehead with the scripture means you're devout, then what if you had a bigger box? Or a, or a bigger box and a bigger box. And so what had happened over that time is there were some, I mean, they were carrying cedar chests on their head, you know. <laughs> a big box with phylacteries there, and also the tassels on their robes. 
uh, the longer the tassel, the more devout you were. So I'm, I, I start getting the picture of a bride in her train, you know, with tassels dra draping along behind you. So these accoutrements of, of what, we, what we call religion can get to be ridiculous. But look what he said. It's not self-seeking. The people who do that kind of stuff are seeking approval from other men. And that's not what you do. It's not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. I want you to just let that settle in here just a minute. Has anyone ex ever experienced any of that kind of stuff in your church life? Yeah, and ought not to be. Ought not to be because if we're a people whose hallmark is love, then for one thing, there shouldn't be anger. And another thing is that once there is a disagreement between people, it should be settled and no record kept of it. We're dealing with such basic human failings here, and they're not a mark of love. So if someone truly has love, they're not going to keep record of that. Love does not delight in evil. That's what it doesn't do. I want you to stop to think about delighting in evil. I, I think sometimes we miss that. Um, we think, well, uh, I don't sin happily. <laughs> really? Well, you know what? It, it, it just happens. Remember, Gary, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. I just hate it when that happens, when I just sin, don't you? You know, I wish I could avoid it, but the devil made me do it, bro. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Does not delight in evil, but you know, we do, and I preached a sermon one time on this that and I I was preaching it to myself but apparently there was some collateral damage in the in the congregation because I said you know what I, I think that very often we're proud of the sins we don't have and we conveniently ignore the sins that we do in fact there are times when we just set that pet sin in our lap and stroke it we treasure that little pet sin I'm not giving it up you know I realize I can see it in you you know what but it's just a little thing. I don't gossip much. <laughs> and we just pet that sin. But look what it says. It said it doesn't delight in evil. If you tolerate it, if you're willing to put up with it in your life, then you are, then you are delighting in evil. Look what the flip side of that is. What, what does love do? It rejoices in the truth. The truth is one of those words that's kind of difficult when we translate it because it's a concept we don't deal with much today. We've kind of lost the concept at all of truth because all truth is relative in society today, but it certainly wasn't in Jesus' time. And so when it talks about truth, remember when he says, I'm the truth, the way, the truth, and the light? The truth will set you free. Okay, it's a recognition of a moral absolute. It rejoices in it. And look at some other fruit. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Paul uses the word hope a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, he referred to Jesus as our blessed hope. Uh, that's one thing that we look forward to is our blessed hope. The problem is that the hope in the vernacular today has gotten to be kind of a wish. Wishful thinking, oh man, I hope I hit the lottery. You know, I hope this happens. I hope we win today. Or I hope Jack finishes on time today. Or hey, I hope this. That's kind of a, a wing and a prayer. You know, it's, it's something that, that, that we kind of, we wish it would happen. That's what we think of hope. Huh? -uh. Hope's talking about something different here. Hope is an unrealized but sure expectation. We have hope in Jesus coming. Does that mean he may not come? Oh, absolutely not. He will come. He will come. That is our hope, the blessed hope, the blessed reappearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he talks about hope, he's not talking about we have hope that we're going to get through this. No, we got a promise we're going to get through this. I read the back of the book and we win. We got a promise. That's our hope. It always perseveres. That's an interesting concept that's shot throughout Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, particularly in Revelation. In the letters to the churches in Revelation, I don't know if you've noticed, it talks about perseverance a lot. Now, you're going to say, well, Pastor, wait a minute. I have walked down the aisle. I trod the sawdust trail. 
I came down here and, and uh, I put my faith in Jesus and I was baptized. I'm in. Well, yeah. But remember what Paul talked about a few weeks ago. He says, you know what? I don't want to go into heaven with the fires of hell singeing my hiney. That's not what he wants. He says, you know what? I want us to persevere. And remember I talked about, about watching track. And one thing I love about track and field, have you seen runners, uh, particularly in a close race, when they cross that tape, what do they do? They lean into it. You see them, I mean, when they run, bursting forward with that last burst of energy. And I mean, they say, okay, if my heart stops, let it stop on the other side of the tape. Because I'm bursting through there. That's the kind of picture he gives us about the Christian life. You don't quit. We don't slow down. And we're to burst through that tape. We're to persevere. And I think too often what we do is we get kind of comfortable. You know, you got that spot right in your pew, the one, you know, the one with the little brass tag on it. And you've hollowed out a little place that fits your backside just about right. You know, and we get comfortable there. That's not perseverance. That's not perseverance. Should you ever stop growing spiritually? No. That wasn't a hard question. No, you shouldn't. That's perseverance, and that's what love does. Love never fails. Now, that alone could stand because that's profound, but look with the, what he pairs this with right after it. Okay, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, there will cease. Now, to whom is he speaking? To those who says, well, I have the gift of prophecy. And he says, well, I got a hot news for you, pal. Prophecy is going to cease one day. Now, there are those who are the cessationists. We talked about them a few weeks ago who talked about spiritual gifts, who thought that spirit, spiritual gifts were pretty well gone, and they used this uh, as support, say, well, prophecies have ceased. I don't think that's what he's talking about. Prophecies will cease, though. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Where they are tongues, they will be stilled. So you speak in tongues? Congratulations. I'm glad that you do. Paul tells us that he spoke in tongues, likely in a prayer language, a private prayer language. But he said, you know what? There will be a point where that's done. Because tongues were given as a miraculous sign so that people would turn their faith to Jesus. That's why tongues were given. And you know what? There will be a time when they're not necessary. Why? Because every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that he's Lord. At that point, you won't need tongues. So he said, you know what? Those are going to be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. You think you have a higher or a deeper revelation about the mysteries of God? Well, you know what? There's going to come a time where every person, no matter what their mental capacity, their spiritual capacity, if they're a believer, God's going to reveal those mysteries to them. So you know what? This knowledge that you're so proud of is going to pass away. I love this one. We know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, okay, we have a revelation, and we prophesy. I'm prophesying now, okay? I'm sharing God's Word now in part because there's coming a prophecy that's so perfect. Just puts this in the shade. We know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Man! You talk about the, the blessed hope is the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes again, perfection's going to come eventually, right? That's what we have to look forward to. And you know what? All the imperfection's going to be gone. All the results of the fall will be gone and will be restored into a right fellowship with God. What a day that's going to be. But all the things that we're dealing with now, all the, they, they're all imperfect. Because of the nature of the fall. Look, when perfection comes, that's going to disappear. Now he's going to give another example, and i got to think that the people to whom he's pointing aren't going to be real happy about that. Look what he said. When I was a child, I talked like a child. Now, he didn't say, uh, that's you. But you know what he's talking about? That's you. He says, okay, look, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. And I reasoned like a child. In other words, that's fine. He's a child. 
That's how he's supposed to talk. That's how he's supposed to act. That's how he's supposed to reason. But you know what? When you're my age, if you're talking, reasoning, and acting like that, there's a problem. When I became a man, I put away childish things behind me. So look what he's saying. He's comparing their knowledge and their spiritual gifts, about which they're proud, not all spiritual gifts. But if you're puffed up, he says, you're like a child. You think you're so great, but you know what? There's going to come a time when you're going to look back and say, whoa, you know, that was like 1A. We've moved way on past that now. He said, you're going to put it behind me. And look what he says. Now we see a poor reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. One of the things for which Corinth was known was the manufacture of quality mirrors. Didn't know if you knew that. They didn't silver glass like we do now, but they used polished brass. And they would polish it through many steps to such a high luster that you could actually get a reasonable reflection of yourself. Uh, any of you in the choir, have you looked at the mirror back in the choir room? Oh, you really need to. Uh, Phil needed to have a mirror back there in the choir room because, after all, when we come out, we want to look our best, don't we? <laughs> and so I was walking by the mirror one day, and I stopped, and I looked, and I said, Well, I know you've lost weight, but, dude, you look really skinny. And so next thing, there was this whole procession of people from the office wanting to go... Because the, that mirror back in the, in, the off, in the choir room back there takes at least 20 pounds on you. Amen? <laughs> it takes 20 pounds off of you. It really do. I mean, if you were that big, now all of a sudden you're this big. And so I, I really hate to say this. I don't want to burst your bubble, but there are some imperfections in the mirror. <laughs> what can I, Phil's actually put a sign up there that said, brief glance is 25 cents. Uh, you know, lingering looks, 50 cents, and oh, what a hot babe, a dollar, you know. <laughs> but I want you to think about these Corinthians, and this is what a perfect example for him. He says, in the mirror, the image you see now, okay, in the image, the, it's a poor reflection. But then we're going to see face to face. In other words, we're going to see exactly what we've seen only in kind of a distorted reflection. And i got to tell you, I think sometimes now when we see ourselves in a spiritual mirror, it's like that mirror back there in the choir room. You know, it's doctored up to make us look the best, but you know what? It's not a true reflection. But then we're going to see just like face to face. You know why none of us like to see pictures of ourselves? Because they're real. And whenever I hear myself on one of the recordings, we'll go back to check the recording, and, and I'll either get the video or check myself. I say, whoa, that dude is ugly. <laughs> and wow, does he really, he sounds like a hick. <laughs> you know, with all that training, you can tell he's from Texas. <laughs> I don't get that from here, but he says, look, in the future we will. We'll see it face to face. Now, and he's talking about people who's, who are puffed up about their knowledge. Now I know in part. Even himself, even Paul, to whom great mysteries have been revealed, when he was taken up to a different heaven even, he says, you know what, I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known by whom? By my Maker. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Now, there's something kind of interesting, because uh, when I read this so many years ago, it was from the King James Version, and it didn't say faith, hope, and love. It says what? Faith, hope, and charity. Well, the difficulty with that is uh, that the word that's translated there is agapao, which is exactly the same word that's translated love so many other places. And that's because at the time that King James had all this translated, charity meant something completely different than, than what it does to us. So love's probably a better translation for us right now because we understand it better than we would charity. But he said three things abide. And if you've read the Pauline letters in his salutations, particularly in, in, uh, and in his farewells, quite often he used those three words. Faith. Stop and think about the, the early church and what type of faith they had to have in a Savior they couldn't see or touch. How about you? Okay. Hope. Not a wish, but a promise. Abide faith and hope. And what's the third? Love. 
So he said, all the things you could be proud of, there are only three things that are going to abide, only three things that are going to last, and here's the greatest one, love. I preached a sermon one time in the, up in Bedford, Texas, uh, that I didn't think was scandalized people, but uh, uh, the title of the, ser- was the sermon was, The Beatles Had It Right. Now, people from our generation, Carolyn, are saying, all you need is love. But you know what? Uh, and you know what? Forget the fact that I said the Beatles, because we know John Lennon, John Lennon couldn't spell Christ if you spotted him the sea. But the fact of the business is, unwittingly, they said, you know what? They were talking about a different kind of love. But the fact is that, that that's what is primary. Now, when you stop and think about that, he said, the greatest of these is love. What did Jesus tell us to do? Two, two, two commandments. What's the first? Love, agape, Lord your God. And number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and all the other commandments are wrapped up in that. The Beatles just didn't understand. But let me tell you what they didn't understand. If love is only a noun, you don't get it. It's got to be a verb. Are you with me? Because there will be fruit. If there is truly love in your life, if you are truly exhibiting love, there will be fruit. You'll be able to see it. In so many ways you'll be able to see it, but love always expresses itself in action. It's easy to talk about love. That's what we did during the 60s. Uh Uh-uh. It wasn't love. You want, a, you want a verb. You've got to express it through action. And here's what he talks about over here in the previous verses, those actions. You know how I can tell you don't love? Because I don't see this, this, and this, and this, and this. And I do see this, this, and this that tells me you're not really loving. Because you know what? There is snobbery. There is a record of wrongs. There is delight in evil. Okay? You don't protect. Remember what he talked about the Lord's Supper in our lesson last week when he says, you know what? You come together, and A, you get drunk, not a good thing. And B, you eat all the food up before the, the late arrivers get there, who generally were the poorer people. So you people had a lot of money, you brought a lot of food, then you ate it all. So you know what? That's not love. That's not love by any stretch of the imagination. So you know what? In this beautiful scripture that I read because of its flowing prose, what he's actually doing is he's wagging his finger at the super Christians in his group and saying, you know what, you're not so hot. Here's what you need to do. I love 1 John chapter 4. Look what it says. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Every time love is mentioned there, it's agape or agapao. We know that we live in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we've seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Dan closed the the service today with saying, you know what? He's never been a part of a church like this. I have to agree with him. I haven't. Um, That's because all the perfect people left, I think. (laughs) We're all just a bunch of imperfects. That's what we are. But I see an expression of love that that really warms me. And we can't ever lose that. We can't lose that. We must carry it forward because we love because he first loved us. Think about that as we go into to next week because we're going to talk more about the prophecies and tongues that he, you know, he's kind of set them up now. He's going to really let them, let them know what he thinks about prophecies and tongues. Read ahead. I think you'll be surprised about what he says. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. 
Father, although the words were penned by man's hand thousands of years ago, Father, they're just as fresh to us today as if we just received them. And I want to thank you for that, Father. I want to thank you for your love for us, for you did so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son. Could we do less? Father, I want to thank you for those who come to share your word. I want to pray that it blossoms like a flower in their lives, that it's meaningful, that it guides them. Bless us as we go our own ways this evening, Father, for we are always people sharing Jesus, and we do it in your name. Amen. Please find someone you don't know and say hello to them.